Thank you. Um, all right, can everyone hear me? Oh, good. So, yeah, exactly like Chris said, something really exciting about this event for the people who are speaking to you is that I mean, part of it is that we get to talk about cool science. Another part is we get to reflect a little bit on the kind of figures that guided us on a path towards research and think about what that experience was like for us. And so something that comes along once a year, it's kind of... So yeah, you need to send those important memes to people. Um, so is like, you know, it's kind of like Science Christmas when the Nobel Prizes come out. You have this little buzz, you're like, what is it this year? And some years it, it's a bit more meaningful than others. And so this year was really meaningful to me as a scientist, the Nobel Prizes in Physics, for a couple of reasons. And so I got together with another physicist who has unfortunately left the school. So, oh, please switch that on. Andrea Blanco Redondo. So half of these slides are hers. And it was a year where the Nobel Prizes in Physics came out and they were really related to what we did. And that felt really special to us. And so it's really delightful to get to talk about this. Um, and some things I'm going to reflect on during this talk are also more about the journey towards becoming a scientist. So you're here, you like science. Maybe you're thinking you want to become a scientist. And there's lots of thoughts that you might be having about that. And those are some things that I'm going to be talking about. But I wanted to start with something that I left out of my talk uh, on Monday that I feel terrible about, is that I also have a personal connection to Harry Messel, and this is him here. Seems pretty stern, right? Secret to gaining knowledge. A lot of hard work. That is true. But then I found this other picture of Harry Messel. So he seems not entirely into hard work. He seemed to be really into alligators. Oh, no, crocodiles as well. And a lot of cigars. Um, so when I was working in America and I was thinking, I want to come back to Australia, I want an academic position, I applied for a Harry Messel Research Fellowship. And that's actually part of what got me back to Australia. So thank you, Harry. I don't know, this, this Harry seems more fun to hang out with than this one. But maybe there's some medium in between. But I guess part of the message that I'm going to try and give you today is that scientists are usually both these things, but you might only see this aspect of science. But I want to really convince you that there is a lot of fun in what we do for our jobs. So I'm going to start this talk with some challenge questions. So a bit like your meme. Uh, these are things that I want you to be thinking about through the talk that might be not be questions that you've thought about before, but they might also be things that are really on your mind. Um, so one is, why would a scientist decide to change research area? You know, you've got training in one area, you're going somewhere, it seems like a good idea. Why would you change track and say, my example, I went from physics to biology? That seems like a big jump. Why would you do that? Um, what are the most important scientific challenges of our time? You might love physics, but you're reading in the news every day about antimicrobial resistance, antibiotics aren't going to work anymore, climate change is a problem, sustainable manufacture is a problem. How can you relate what you're doing to what are the problems that we see and that we care about and that the people around us care about? Um, and this is a big one that people don't really talk about a lot, is what personal events have affected your academic path? And what, might personal, what uh, personal events might affect it? And how do you feel about that? This is a really tough one that a lot of us sort of agonize over a bit. Is competition in academia good or bad? It's a very competitive environment sometimes in science. What does that bring us? What does it take away? And I guess this is the one most pertinent to you right now. How do you choose your career direction? What are the important things that are going to guide you along that path? And are they really what you think they're going to be? Um, so these are the kind of things that you might think about during this talk. So the, the Nobel Prize in 2018, why was this special to me? It was special to me because I love light. I started in photonics. I think studying light is really cool. And I like, as you might have heard on Monday, I like building stuff and I like moving things around and playing with them. And the, one of the Nobel Prize, so one of the winners this year, last year, sorry, was optical tweezers for studying molecular nanomachines. So I can see you can probably think about why I care about that one. And I'm going to start off talking by, about Arthur Ashkin's work. Um, so Arthur Ashkin was awarded the Nobel Prize for optical tweezers and their application to biological systems. So this is already right down my alley, physics to study biology. And this is him here in, in Bell Labs in 1988. And this is a cover of a Nature Methods paper and so essentially what an optical tweezer is, a focused beam of laser light. So this is representing that focused beam of light. And for reasons that will become clear to you soon, or maybe you already know, you can trap a microsphere in the focal point of that laser, actually just below it. 
And you can use it to study, in this case, this is a molecular motor. So there'll be more details about this later. But this is the broad concept, is you're using light as a pair of tweezers, in a sense, to trap objects and move them around, which feels a bit like science fiction, a bit like your kind of tractor beam in your science fiction movie. So this is Arthur Ashkin here. And I guess when you start researching a talk like this, you want to think about the person as well as the science. And uh, he seems like a really fun guy. So this is, I'm going to, hopefully this will play the sound. May I ask, are you still experimenting in your home lab? I am. In fact, I'm writing a paper now that uh, you guys are disturbing in my, uh, I'm going to send it into science and uh, hope that they'll accept it. So this was uh, a journalist calling him, being like, how do you feel about winning the Nobel Prize? He was like, you're in my way. I'm trying to do good science. Stop bothering me. And I feel like that's a, a mentality that a lot of us have in science. We're like, what matters is the work. The accolades come along with it, but we're really passionate about what we're doing. I also, and so this is him here with a, a book that he's written. I also love this picture of his office. My office isn't this bad yet, but I have aspirations. I really like the sign he has. I very much agree with this mentality. A clean desk is a sign of a sick mind. I would say the opposite is that a messy desk is the sign of a creative mind. That's what I'm, what I'm going with. Um, and you know, he has a sense of humility about him. It was like, I was interested in science as a kid, so I tell myself, to tell my wife, that's the only thing I'm really good at. He sounds like someone who'd be fun to have a great conversation with, and that he was really focused still on the science. And I thought that was a lovely quote about him. And so I added this slide, because the last time I gave a presentation a bit like this, somebody asked me about the graph on the next page I'm going to show, me, show you, and they asked me what the y-axis was. What were the units of the y-axis? And <laughs> I wasn't really thinking about that when I made the graph. The next graph is a bit of fiction. So it was my interpretation of what I thought Arthur's scientific career was. When I looked at you know, his whole Wikipedia page, read a lot about him, I was like, and it's kind of like my creative interpretation of what would be my mood if these things were happening to me. So, you know, maybe his interpretation was entirely different. This is just trying to give you a feel for, like, how people might feel during their scientific careers. So I guess when I was a student and still when I was in grad school, I would say, you know, things start out when you're born and it's just upwards from there and you get your Nobel Prize. And I think part of the problem with having that expectation is when things don't go that way, you feel really bad. And the reality is no scientific career that I know of is like that. So when I was like looking at events through Arthur's life, I was like, well, maybe it's something more like this. So I'm going to talk you through some of these events. So I think you can guess something important happens around the beginning. Um, but it's not actually when he was born. Something really important in his life happened way before he was born. And that's that his parents arrived in America. And they arrived before two really important historical events that would have shaped his life hugely. Um, so th those are the wars that, that happened in Europe. Um, and then be just before he was born, like two years before he was born, his brother Julius was born. So the problem was that Julius was regarded as the family genius. Two years older, a lot of us have competitive older siblings. I am the competitive older sibling, so. <laughs> I, I, know, I know how that can be difficult for the younger sibling. Um, and two years later, Arthur was born. And so I knew they had, he had a childhood. There's not much um, information about that. But around 1940, he finished school. Um, and then something really big happened. A war happened. And of course, this is a total life-changing event, even if you live in America. And he was conscripted, actually. Um, luckily for him, he is a very smart, intelligent person. He got put into the reserves. He ended up working in a kind of related scientific field. So, you know, it wasn't too big of a setback for him personally. But it delayed him finishing his bachelor's degree. So here he's 25. So most people are a little bit younger than that when they finish their bachelor's degree. And sometimes that can feel like a big hurdle to get past. He got his first paper about 27. That's also a little bit older than average. Depends on, you know, what field you're in. but you know, he was going pretty well. He got his first paper. Then he graduated with a PhD. Great, things are back on track. He got a PhD in nuclear physics. Great time of, of uh, science to be doing nuclear physics in the 1950s. 
Ah, oh, but now we hit a hurdle. He quit nuclear physics. Why? He just got a PhD in it. His brother was really famous in it. His brother was working on the Manhattan Project. He wasn't. So he quit nuclear physics because I was known as Ashkin's brother, Ashkin. So this is this, like sometimes we make these personal decisions to totally change our research direction uh, for, for reasons that seem uh, that are not logical to people outside of that individual. But there's nothing wrong with making that decision. Um, and then something really cool happened. There was kind of unrelated to what he was doing. In 1960, lasers were invented. This new technology, exciting stuff has started happening. Um, and at the time, he was working in Bell Labs, a really exciting place. It's not a university. It was the American Telephone Company. Uh, but it's a site where lots of really exciting photonics and laser science was happening. Then there was a breakthrough. He uh, was involved in some research around acceleration and trapping of particles by radiation pressure, moving stuff with light. This was the cool idea that he had, um, and a real breakthrough here, like a kind of career pinnacle event in the 70s. But then what happened? His funding was cut. Mid-70s, really no money. And so he was working in Bell Labs. He had a job, but he couldn't really do much research. It was a bit of a, it sounded like from what I read, so a time of personal frustration. I know for myself, you have ideas, you're ready to go, you have no resources to carry them through. It can be pretty frustrating. What happened? Someone new was recruited. So this is Stephen Chu, who's also a very famous physicist. Uh, and he arrived, and I guess Ashkin was this like, kind of older guy around there, trying to take these young minds, these fresh minds with resources, and give them these weird ideas and sway them away from their path. And so Ashkin apparently said, wouldn't it be nice if you could hold on to an atom with light? Kind of like revolutionary thing to say. And Steve Chu's response was that he was this new young person who could be corrupted with these ideas of doing really, really difficult things and sort of turned away from his path um, and enticed with his resources to, to this new uh, area of research. And so partnership is really important in science. So that idea of bringing expertise together with resources. And that did happen. So they did trap atoms with light. So that breakthrough was the observation. Oh, so the next breakthrough, so these, you know, you can see these lines here are sort of coming thick and fast. We've got Next, the breakthrough was the observation of a single beam gradient force optical trap. So an optical trap that could hold dielectric materials, not just pushing things around, but holding them. Then what happened? The next breakthrough. And so this is the work, these three breakthroughs that I'm describing are the papers that, was, that were quoted in the Nobel Prize Award. So that is using the optical trap to manipulate single cells. So in this case, using infrared light, so you're not frying the cells. Or they did fry some cells. And then he was demoted. Is demoted being a bad thing? Well, on paper it sounds like it, but when you're head of a department, head of a sub-department either, you have to do a lot of boring admin work. So, you know, you could say the demotion was a bad thing. Maybe it was a really great thing. Maybe he just didn't want to do all the paperwork. But suddenly he was demoted, and then he retired. His retirement, this great sort of uh, uh, relaxation time. Well, not for him. He built himself a basement lab, and he spent the next 20 years working at home. And um, it's pretty impressive. He published 22 papers in this time. So for him, retirement might have been a, maybe a slightly more lonely time, but definitely it wasn't the end of his scientific career. And it, uh, you know, I guess that's the sign of how much his passion, this was his passion, not, not his job. But then some things happened. So Stephen Chu got his Nobel Prize. Um, some other work based on optical, optical traps on both Einstein and condensates got a Nobel Prize. And I guess he kind of felt like that ship had sailed. It wasn't going to happen for him. These kind of more uh, sort of applications of his technology were, were getting prizes. So at 96, you could forgive him from being a bit surprised that it came around to him. So it took a good 20 years longer than the people who did work based on his work um, to, get, to get his prize compared to them. And this ties back to that problem of the important scientific questions of our age. So he was asked questions along the line of, what is important about what you achieved? And he was like, well, solar energy is my next paper. That's what I care about now. And that's because the most important problem we're facing 
is the climate is the climate change crisis. So, you know, he had already moved past his foundational work and he's like, you know what I care about now? I care what's gonna affect my children and grandchildren. I care about those pressing scientific uh, problems of our age. And he had made that change, another research direction change throughout his life. And hopefully he's still working on it because we need everyone working on it that we can have. So that's my interpretation of Arthur Ashkin's life. And hopefully, <laughs> sorry, he's not calling us. <laughs> um, so yeah, that's my interpretation of what his life might be. He might have a totally different interpretation and probably it sounds like he would say, what I really care about is the science. So now we're going back to the science. Um, and so what is the, the physics behind his Nobel Prize? So the, the co fundamental concept um, is pretty old and it, the first idea of it came back in the 1619. Um, this idea of radiation pressure, that light can exert a force. Um, and the evidence behind this was that if you look at comet tails and the direction of the sun, the tails are like kind of moving away. That's not a, a, good, a good space uh, detail there. But, um, you know, and then in 1862, Maxwell predicted that an electromagnetic, electromagnetic wave carries momentum. And if you think of uh, photons in a kind of more quantum sense, you can, you can think of them as particles, and then you know that they have a property of momentum. Oh, no. <laughs> wow. <laughs> these are my equations. I should have done the screen capture again. Um, these are actually really simple equations. <laughs> so I, this is, <laughs> I think it was like, P equals I over C. I don't know how this came to that. That's pretty impressive. Um, so the idea is that the pressure exerted by an uh, electromagnetic wave on a surface is proportional to the intensity of the light and the speed of light. Whatever the... <laughs> no, that's okay. I mean, I think everyone can picture that equation in their mind. Um, here's, and here's a diagram. If you're thinking of the electromagnetic field, you can think of your right-hand rule and you can convince yourself that if this is a particle on the surface of a material, that the force is pushing it away. Um, you can also think about, and this is my second equation that has come up differently, that if the light is reflected, you get twice the change of momentum, so you get twice the radiation pressure. So depending on what the material is made of and the optical properties of it, you could get different behavior. I don't even remember what this one was. <laughs> yeah, uh, don't put uh, toxic things in the mailbox. <laughs> Certainly not without sticky tape. <laughs> um, so uh, it was, oh, okay, yes, I do remember what this. The skull and bones are white. Pardon? The skull and bones are white. Oh, that could be the Y? Maybe. Um, so this equation said something along the lines of, uh, it was like trying to put some numbers to those values for the Earth. So if there's all this radiation pressure or this force from like sunlight falling on us, why don't we feel weighed down by it? Um, and this formula was doing a really nice back of the envelope calculation on what is the radiation and pressure on Earth from the sun. And basically the units end up being like, I guess this is uh, very small. <laughs> um, and so it's very hard to measure and it's very hard to detect and it's not something you experience day to day. And so the first experimental demonstration of this wasn't until 1903, where this is actually done in a vacuum and it's very delicately balanced set of reflective discs and there is kind of, well I guess like this, light coming in and you can actually see them spin. So you can see a deflection from the radiation pressure against these um, very delicately balanced reflective disks. And the idea, I mean, and I love looking up these old papers. I mean, because this was in the time well before computers. How do you make a graph without Excel? I still don't know. This is a beautiful graph. Is this somebody's lovely handwriting? I don't know. Um, but I like, it's really fun to look up old papers and look at how the ways we represent scientific information has changed because it's very similar to what I would do in Excel. It just looks kind of more classy. Okay, so that's the fundamental physics of radiation pressure. How do we turn, turn that into moving things around? So there's this idea of moving objects with light. So this is the first of Arthur's papers that came out in 1970. This is the first one quoted in his Nobel Prize Award. 
And it's this idea that you can accelerate and trap particles by radiation pressure. So we know what radiation pressure is now. How do we use it to exert uh, acceleration and trapping of particles? And so here we're going to use kind of like the wave idea of light. Um, you can also imagine it, it from like thinking of photons as particles. But here, this is a dielectric sphere. So the light is going to travel through it. It's just going to be refracted. And when you get a refraction, you're kind of getting a change in direction of the light. It's like equivalent to a change in momentum. So you're going to exert a force on the particle. And so if you think this is not a uniform beam, this is the beam here, this is the beam intensity. And as a profile with, in this case, Z, the beam intensity varies. So we can also represent this in this case as the Gaussian of a laser. So the laser focus is here, the beam is converging and the beam is diverging. And if we look at the profile along this point, that's plotted as this, that line there. So the idea is that you have light coming in on this side, it's refracted upwards, so there's a force, and you have light coming in on this side of the particle, it's refracted downwards and there's the force. And if the intensity of the light is more here than there, these forces will be unbalanced. So you get a pressure towards the center of the beam. And then you also get forward change. So you get scattering forward. So you get the particles moving forwards and it's also moving towards that level uh, area of high intensity. Um, another way to represent this is to sort of code that intensity with increasing opacity. So this is the laser beam. This is a collimated laser now. So the sphere is moving along. And so this is the scattering force forward. And then you also have a gradient force that's going to push it towards the most intense area of light. And you can also think, well, we can like push stuff along. Can we bring it back? Well, not really in this, in this way we've written it there. But you could turn this laser beam and point it up towards the ceiling. And eventually, you have radiation pressure. And then you'll have that imbalance with gravity. So you can kind of levitate things the same way you would say with air pressure. With radiation pressure, you can make these dielectric spheres uh, levitate. So how do we get from that to optical tweezers? Um, and you might notice, like, this is a paper. There's not really any data in there. I was like, where's the figure? Where's the, you know, the hero image? Uh, this is mostly just a description of what happened. It's kind of nice. I guess maybe, maybe science was more trustworthy back then. Um, and this is the next paper. And this one does have a nice uh, picture. And you might notice now that the authorship has changed. Now this is Ash Ashkin and Stephen Chu, who we heard about earlier. And this is the observation of optical tweezers. So a single beam gradient force, so that's that gradient force because of the different intensities of light, an optical trap for dielectric particles. And so this is an idea, instead of having a collimated beam, you put a lens in there. And then so you have not just a changing intensity in the z direction, you have changing intensity in the x direction and the y direction as well, though you can't really see here. And if you had the lens, you could sort of push it downwards. But really what you want is to balance the force to hold things there. So in this case, you want the radiation pressure. So the, in this case, if we're pushing it downwards, we have radiation pressure down. We have gravity of the microsphere down. And then we have the, that gradient force upwards. And if we can get our laser power and our, if you think of the gradient steep enough, so is that focus sharp enough, then we can balance those forces and the particle will stay where we're, we're holding it. And the interesting thing is that the light is supposed to be pushing it away, but that gradient force is enough to hold it back up. And then this is, this is the picture. I was like, oh, wow, that's really cool. It could be anything. It's not even any, any axes on this or a scale bar. Um, it wouldn't pass muster in a third year lab or a first year physics lab now. Uh, but this is a, a, the diagram with the similar kind of wave uh, description of light as before. This is your laser beam. It's coming through a lens. It's being focused. The interesting point that a lot of people don't realize is that the bead, the bead is kind of just sitting below the focus. It doesn't sit at the focus. Um, and this is the light being refracted through here. And this is the force pushing it back upwards. So that's how an optical trap works. But what are we going to do with them? So one trap is fine. You can just hold a sphere. That's cool. I mean, what are you going to do with your dielectric sphere? It's just kind of like usually polystyrene. Um, you could just look at it. 
it's, I think after a while, they must have been like, well, surely there's something cool we can do with this technology other than just hold a dielectric sphere still. I mean, they do move around with Brownian motion if you're not holding them still. So I guess that's an improvement if you like still spheres. Um, but I guess kind of the more recent advances were like, well, what can you do if you have more than one optical trap? And so maybe you need to set up systems with multiple lasers, with multiple traps. That's a big hassle, especially with having a single lens to get everything aligned. Anyone who's ever built a microscope would say, don't do that. Instead, you want to have like a liquid crystal system to have basically holography. So you get many, uh, you basically many beam focal points from one source. So, and then you can use a computer to control how that, that works and control the position of those laser, those laser focal points independently, even though you only have one laser. And this all goes through the same objective, and this is the sample here. So once you have many traps, what could you do? Well, I guess people get creative, so I'm gonna try and play some videos. And no, I have to use the mouse. Um, and so these are all dielectric spheres here. These ones, I think, are a couple of microns. So six times, you know, 10 to the minus six. So we can see them and it's cool. You've got these ones counter rotating in the middle and the, these ones going around the outside. Um, the untrapped particles, you can see are moving in and out of focus. They're bobbing around with Brownian motion. These ones are held very still and moved in really nice paths. So I don't know if there's people from the UK here. I don't know if there's any Scottish people here. Maybe people into Scottish or Irish dancing. Um, oh no. If you are, so these, these researchers got really into the idea of uh, having microspheres dancing. So if you've ever done like, I guess there's different types of square dancing or like partner dancing. So this, this dance is called Strip the Willow. <laughs> um. <laughs> I wonder how long it goes for. Okay. How much? <laughs> That's a great question. Somebody just asked me how much did that cost? I mean, the neat thing is once you build this, this is kind of free. Microspheres are super cheap. Maybe PhD student time isn't super cheap, but you know, a motivated student will do what they want. Um, so yeah, once, well, these, the cool thing about these systems is once you build them, they're reconfigurable for lots of different applications. Um, and then this is my personal favorite because I, I like self-assembly. So <laughs> this one I'm disappointed doesn't have a soundtrack. So this is a group from the Netherlands who's uh who's made microspheres so each of these spheres is two microns so if you think this is two by ten to the minus six <laughs> and they've they've used their fancy uh holographic optical tweezer array to play tetris i wonder i can't remember if they do it really well <laughs> they don't have the speeding up though it should get harder <laughs> 42, these are glass microspheres. And they've got a little ticker tape here. So the cool thing about this, this movie is real time. This isn't sped up. This is happening in real time. So you can do um, really sophisticated things with a lot of time and spatial accuracy. So this Theodore, Bram, and Joost, they must have had a pretty fun day that day. <laughs> I'm not sure if their supervisor knew they were doing that. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh yeah, now they're losing. No, <laughs> this is kind of frustrating to watch, isn't it? This is no way. No, don't put that there. <laughs> um, how much longer does this one go for? Oh no, we're nearly there. I don't think they lose at the end, but it's not looking good. They don't have many pieces left. They're running it. Oh. And so that's what happens when you turn the trap off. All the spheres. Brownian motion just destroys the order that you've created. <laughs> so I guess again, my, I love my talks go like this, like that's really fun, but what is the use of this technology? 
Um, and so I've got a few slides now on the biological applications. So this is the third paper quoted in the Nobel Prize because uh, you know, there's a, a really nice application of these. And this is that idea, again, of making tools to understand biology. And this is something that a, a lot of really important physics goes along the line of. And this is optical trapping and manipulation of viruses and bacteria. And this one came out in 1986. And I guess, yeah, this is, this is his science paper. This is, I think, one of his higher impact papers. This is the one where he's like, I'm finally going to submit my work to science and maybe they accept it. But he should get one in. He did still seem a bit bitter about it in that voice capture that we had. So this is the idea that you have something in an optical trap and you can watch it moving with a microscope. That's what we were seeing in those previous videos. Uh, but you can also get more accurate time information from it by looking at the light that the particle scatters as well. Um, especially if it's a high scattering particle, then you can get very high resolution time and spatial data about where that particle is from the scattered light. And so these are like units in scattering. So you can see in time in minutes, something is happening in this optical trap. So in this case, this could be trapping viral particles. This is one, then suddenly it traps two, it traps three. So you're increasing the scattering. So you can see individual particles that you wouldn't be able to detect otherwise. Here they've turned the trap off, everything floats away, and then you can see it trapping more and more. Often when you're trying to do optical trapping experiments, this is not what you're trying to do. You're trying to get just one, and when another one comes into your trap, your data goes bad, and you like, have to switch it off and start again. And then these are some measurements they made of a live bacteria trapped with five milliwatts of laser power, so it's kind of reasonable. Um, and it's kind of wriggling around. So you can measure things about the way bacteria swim. They have like little flagella that spin around. You can measure how bacteria swim really, really accurately. Um, and then the power was increased to 100 milliwatts at this point, and suddenly the bacteria slows down. And they decided that the, the bacterium was killed and apparently loses much of its cell content. So I guess they made the uh, world's most inefficient antibacterial, one bacteria at a time. And we used to actually run this as a third year teaching experiment in the, in the teaching labs where I was a PhD student. And I guess physics students aren't used to working with even microbes very, very much. Usually they work with things like, you know, uh, lenses, things that are never living. And we would do this experiment and we'd plot how fast the bacteria died um, as a function of the laser power. And was it a one photon or a two photon damage process? And they, they would inevitably become a part of the, the practical where they were like, is, are we destroying the bacteria? Is it slowing down because it's dying? Yes, it's slowing down, it's spinning because it is dying because we are blasting it with a giant laser. But every time you put the Purell or the um, ethanol on your hands, that's way more bacteria you're killing. So really don't worry about this one. We're also feeding it a lot of nice, uh, um, you know, giving it lots of food. It's, it was very happy until the end. <laughs> but it's easy to anthropomorphize anthropomorphize a bacteria when you're studying just one. So what else can we do with them? We can see bacteria move around. We can do things about measure how fast the molecular motors that push them around work. Um, but it's kind of more interesting than that. We don't just have to measure their properties in terms of time or space. We can measure them in terms of force. So this is the idea that as, say, you have a, a microsphere, it should be in the center of this beam. The gradient force is pushing it towards the center. If there's some other force acting on that particle, uh, it can displace it from the center. And it's going to feel a restoring force. So most of us will be familiar with this idea of thinking of this as a spring. So as the particle is moved further and further away from the center of the beam, it in, uh, experiences a linearly increasing, at least for some region, for a small region, a linearly increasing force back. And so this is a way to measure forces similar to you, the way you would use a spring balance. So if you have something else on this sphere, you can figure out what's it doing, what sort of forces it is exerting. And you can do that in the pico-newton range. So that's very small amounts of force. So pico is 10 to the minus 10. And this is what a modern optical tweezer looks like. So this is, I don't know, how do I explain this diagram? This is a very sophisticated microscope. But essentially here you have a light source, you have some filters, and here you have, and this is the objective lens, so this is the condenser lens. 
Light is focused here. The sample is sitting here. There's another lens. This is the objective. You have a bunch of mirrors and filters, polarizers, dichroics, and you're sending in two lasers from this direction, the trapping laser and the detection laser. The trapping laser is what's creating that gradient force to hold the particle. The detection laser in this case is the scattering laser that we're going to use to detect what the particle is doing. And we also have a video camera just to, to see what on earth is going on when you're trying to focus your microscope and stuff. So this comes from the Block Lab. That's a very big lab that does a lot of optical tweezer experiments. And so where are piconewton forces? Piconewton forces are everywhere in biology. And so this is one of those molecular motors, which is the one that I told my physics friends about, and they did not believe me. So this is, this looks like an artist's interpretation. It is, but this is real crystallographic data of what these motors look like. Although the motor people haven't really got their nomenclature down. So they call these the heads, the hands of the motor. So no, these are the feet of the motor, but they say it walks hand over hand. So I'm confused. But basically, these things, they're kind of walking or crawling along. And it's carrying some cargo, so this could be a vesicle, could contain neurotransmitters that are made in the center of your neurons. It needs to go to the synapse. Could be just other cellular cargo. And they have little tags on them saying, this is where I need to go. Motors come and attach to them, and they take them along these tracks. In this case, it's a microtubule, and this motor is called myosin. And, oh no, this one is kinesin. Um, in this case, the block lab are doing things like taking their laser beam, taking the cargo off the kinesin, and putting a microsphere there instead. So this is now, it's kind of, it's being tricked into carrying our, our own cargo for us. And you have the track here, and the kinesin molecule is going to exert a force on the sphere that's in the optical trap. So you can use the optical track as it pulls away from here. You can measure the displacement. We know the spring constant. We can measure the force. And we can do that for very small steps. So this is the kinesin walking along the microtubule. And so this is some data, and it's nice here. The time axis is very different to the graphs I was showing on Monday. So this is in seconds. So these motors move extremely quickly, and they take, in this case, eight nanometer steps. So you can see each step as it moves out of the trap. And you can see that often in real time um, where they're working, walking at physiological speeds, which is pretty incredible because these machines are, you know, if you think of this, this is eight nanometers across here. Very small, very efficient machines. They move much faster than my DNA walkers, for sure. Can we see the video of the big walk on? Yes, yes. <laughs> Be patient. <Sorry. laughs> um, and so this is an animation of a motor protein. This one's kinesin. There's a couple of different ones. We're going to talk about a different one, myosin soon. So this is this lovely animation that you might have seen. I encourage you all to watch it. Um, really beautiful work that's both visualization and scientifically accurate. So they're taking crystal structures of proteins and using them to do this artistic animation. And I guess the way they've animated it kind of like stomps along. Um, so that's, that's kinesin. And the interesting thing you can see there, it's walking like, it's kind of like stumping along, but it's walking like foot over foot. So it's like, um, we, we think of you know, molecular motors, there's lots of different ways of walking. You might walk, if you're in a hurry somewhere, you're taking one foot over past the other. Um, and that's a really fast way to walk somewhere where you're like in a hurry, you know what you're doing. Um, and th but there's lots of other ways that molecular motors walk. And one of these things this optical traps give us a handhold to do is study the different types of way that they walk in. Ha, huh, and we're back to DNA again. How did we get there? Um, and so this is where, this is part of why I got excited about this Nobel Prize in particular, because as part of my postdoc work, I got to work with optical trapping of molecular motors. So I was like, yes, that optical trap, they're really, really useful. So we all talked about DNA on Monday, so we know that DNA is useful to physicists. And actually, one of the most famous physicists was really into DNA, uh, but he called it an aperiodic crystal. And I did have, I often have arguments with physicists about whether my research is physics or not. And they're like, well, Schrodinger thought so, so I'm allowed to think so too. So you can think of a gene as a linear one dimensional crystal that lacks the periodic repeat, like an aperiodic crystal. 
And so, as I mentioned on Monday, we're using DNA as a programmable information containing polymer. And we have this idea of base pairing. Base pairing lets us program selective stickiness into our molecules so we can make complex nanostructures. In this case, there's a little junction. We've got some revision here, smiley faces. People remember the smiley faces? The alien, the heart, the robot, robot person with flapping arms. Seems like quite unhappy. Um, and then this is the DNA origami that I was using with optical traps. So I mentioned it really briefly on Monday and I skipped over it because I knew this talk was coming. This is this idea of making a force sensor using DNA origami. The same way we can approximate the optical trap as a spring, we can also try and make a DNA molecule that acts like a spring as well. In this case, we had a really long involved discussion about what should a nanoscale spring look like? I mean, that's the great thing about the nanoscale. It doesn't necessarily have to look like a macroscale spring. But we kind of got to an impasse where we were like, well, we don't know. Let's just make a nanoscale spring that looks like a macroscale spring, which is what we did. So this is a, a model of it. We did some simulations. This is a transmission electron microscope image we took of it. So again, you might remember we, an electron microscope just like a light microscope, but with electrons, so we can see things in more detail. And this scale bar here is 20 nanometers. But when we looked at them, they looked a little bit more like a ramen noodle than a spring. Um, they kind of, you can see these are a little bit faint because they're very narrow, but they do have some of the curvature features we thought, but we did, really didn't know, did we make the thing that we wanted to do? And it's like, well, how do you just define a spring? I should mention this work is in collaboration with Mitsuo Waki at Osaka University, who is a brilliant single molecule biologist, and a lot of the very beautiful data you're about to see is entirely his work. I was involved in making this spring, and uh, we made the spring together. He was visiting Boston for a while, and as many collaborations happened, he took the springs back to Japan, and there was silence. And I thought, the springs don't work. And then two years later, he sent back all this incredible data. And how do you check your spring works like a spring? You need another spring to measure it. So in this case, we use DNA origami springs in Arthur Ashkin's optical trap. So this is idea we attach one end of the nanospring to a glass cover slip. And all you need to know about this is that it, we, it was some sticky proteins that we used to do it. And we put a microsphere on the other end. Then we use the microsphere to pull on the, on the spring and measure its force displacement curve, just the way you would with a macro scale spring. And we had some theories about, you know, from simulations about how this might work. So if you imagine just a bundle of DNA, but a bundle of DNA is like a ball of wool on the molecular level, it kind of forms a clump. So you can imagine if you have a, as long as it's not knotted, a ball of wool and you pull on two ends, you pull and there's no force pulling back, you keep pulling. And then suddenly the bundle's totally unraveled and you experience a sudden increase in force because you're at what's called the contour length of the string. The string is entirely uh, straight. And so this is what happens for double-stranded DNA. You pull on it. So this is extension in nanometers. This is force in piconewtons. Um, you pull on it, and then suddenly you hit the contour length. The force goes way up. So this is not a good spring to measure things around two piconewtons because what you want is a linear force displacement curve around the forces you're interested in measuring. And then this is some experimental data about our nanospring. And what you see is that this region for which it's linear is much wider. And importantly, that region covers the forces we're interested in, which is about two piconewtons, and the extensions we're interested in, which is a couple hundred nanometers. So suddenly we have a tool. It looks like a spring in our theory. It looks a little bit like a spring in our images. But the most important thing is that it acts like a spring for the forces and the extensions that are relevant to us. And so what do you do when you have a spring in molecular motors? You set up a tug of war. Um, <laughs> so in this case, we have two types of different type of molecular motor. This one's called myosin. It looks pretty similar to the kinesin you saw in that video. It has two feet, and it moves hand over hand over along a track. This is a smaller track. It's called actin. And in this case, we put fluorophores, so bright molecules, on the spring itself. And we've got two types of myosin, so of course it's not just one type in your body. It's biology, so there's a billion types. Um, they all do slightly different things that we don't understand, very frustrating. And this is myosin 6 on one end, and this is myosin 2 on the other end. 
And myosin 2 in this state is supposed to be just tethered to the track. It doesn't move around. Whereas myosin 6 is going to walk in this direction. It's going to try and walk forward. So this is, oh, what was that? This is a video of that spring. So you can see myosin 6 starts pulling away. Myosin 2 is just sitting on the end here. And then it reaches a point and it lets go. And the spring pulls it back. Oop. I'll try and play the video again. It's a bit short. So it reaches a point where it must reach its maximum force. And for a motor, we call that the stall force. So it's experiencing a linearly increasing force. It stalls. It lets go of the track. It can't keep walking forwards. The spring kind of pings back, and it keeps trying again. Because it really wants to get away from the mice in two. Maybe they're not friends. And then so this is looking at a plot along this molecule as a function of time here. It's a chymograph that I also mentioned on Monday. So you can see then that you see this extension of the, of the spring and then a snapback extension. And this is really valuable because you can study the same molecule over and over again and actually get statistics. So this is what's called single molecule biology because what we're studying here is a single molecule of myosin. And there's a nice joke that I like to tell about single molecule biology is that you only need the experiment to work once. <laughs> but unfortunately, that's not true. You need it to work once to get the cute video, and then you need to gather a lot of statistics to prove that that's actually a real result. Um, and so it's really nice that you get statistics from the same molecule here, and you can really quantify its behavior. And of course, you don't just have to label the track. You can also label the heads of the motor. Um, and this is, no, the feet. I always get confused the bits that are walking. Um, and this is interesting because, as I mentioned before, there's different types of walking. So maybe you're in a hurry, you're going to walk really quickly, like taking one step after the other, and suddenly you hit a patch of ice. There's no ice in Sydney. Where I lived in Boston, lots of ice. And when you walk really quickly on ice, you fall over. Um, so you might start shuffling. You're taking smaller steps. Say you're walking up some big stairs. Instead of taking one step, two steps at a time, you take one step and then bring the other one up. And so that way of walking in molecular motor speak is called inchworm. And we had another long debate about, do inchworms actually move like that? I'm not sure. But there's two types of walking, basically hand over hand and inchworm walking. And like you would use different types of walking for different situations, so do these molecular motors. But nobody had been able to study that before. So the idea was that maybe there's some force sensor in this molecule. Pretty cool molecule, can walk around, also sense forces, and change its behavior based on the forces that it's sensing. So the idea was this molecule, it's got no cargo behind it. It's just on its way to pick up a cargo. It's you know, moving very quickly. It's in a situation where um, I guess the, the problem is if you're walking hand over hand, and you're surrounded by Brownian motion, things are moving around, you can easily fall off the track. So maybe you're in a situation where it's low risk. It's all right if you fall off the track. You want to move quickly. You don't want to uh, sort of slow down to be more careful. You would move hand over hand. But this motor also does two things. So it moves stuff around the cell, and it also anchors things like the cilia that help you hear in your inner ear. And in that case, it wants to be very strong anchor it wants to resist falling off the track. And so in that case, it might have different behavior. Say it might work in an inchworm way. And what Mitsu was able to show is that this motor does exactly that. So here we have displacement, which because we have a spring and we've calibrated our spring with the optical trap, is equivalent to force. So this is force in piconewtons. And we know the stall force of this motor is around 2.6 piconewtons. And this is time here, so five seconds every division. And so this is one particular motor, and we've labeled the two uh, feet here in different colors, orange and red. And what we see here is the red trace and the orange trace. And you can see you get an orange step, then a red step, orange step, then a red step. So that's hand over hand walking at low force. And then something changes around here. And at this force, suddenly we get inchworm stepping. So we get um, an orange step and then a red step, and then the orange step only catches up to the red one. It doesn't pass it. Um, same thing here. There's a red step, and the orange one just catches up to it. It doesn't step over. So we've moved to inchworm stepping at high force. And that, that region only happens for a little time, because then we reach the force that's the stall force, and eventually it just sits there for a while and detaches. 
And that's not something you could really measure in many other ways. Um, and of course, you don't just get your hero trace, but you've got some really beautiful statistics. And this looks at, say, without load, so this is in the low force regime. If you're moving hand over hand or foot over foot, your feet aren't together side by side very often. So this is uh, kind of side by side orientation. And this is one foot in the front, and this is the other foot in the front. So mostly, if you're walking foot over foot, one of your feet is in the front position. Whereas if you're walking in a shuffling, inchworm way, you've got very long time spent with your foot, feet side by side. And so when you have a, a force equivalent to kind of just under the stall force, you get a lot of sitting in the shuffling position. And so this is really interesting. How do these proteins do this? Nobody has any idea. But it's really fascinating that we can use optical traps and nano, uh, DNA origami nanostructures to kind of get this detailed information about how these molecular motors are working and ask these qu types of questions. And you can imagine then doing some mutation studies on that protein to try and piece apart what is the biochemical mechanism by which it does some really amazing things. Like there's no brain here telling these feet, it's icy now, stop walking in that way, you're gonna fall over. How does the molecule know? We really don't know. But what, what happens next? So maybe you don't have a lab of your own. Maybe you wanna be inspired by Arthur Ashkin and have a very big <laughs> uh, caveat here, always wear eye protection working with lasers. Uh, I do not recommend taking apart lasers, uh, but people on the internet have done it. Um, and so you could, uh, I guess that's his ethos with his uh, basement lab, is that you can make your own optical trap from pretty simple components. And in this case, these people on YouTube have made one from a disassembled DVD player. I guess nobody watches DVDs anymore. We're all streaming stuff. <laughs> so we've got all these spare DVD players. And if you look really closely here, these are two microspheres here. They're scattering some laser light towards us. That's why they're bright. And they've used their trap there in that, in that laser beam. So you can make an optical trap. You can make a really fancy experimental one with holography. You can also make some really simple ones because you think about it, the physics is pretty basic. And the materials now, lasers are really cheap. Although, always wear eye protection. Your eyesight is very precious. And where could we go in the future? I started Googling, like, what next for optical traps? And I found this fantastic picture on the internet. The internet is a wonderful place. Maybe we could have teleportation by optical tweezers with it being put into this giant laser beam and put, I guess, down an optical fiber. I, I don't really believe this is ever going to happen. But I guess you heard me talk on Monday, I believe nanorobots are going to happen. And optical tweezers are probably going to tell us things about how we're going to get our motors to move around. So that's the first half of my talk. And you might know the Nobel Prize doesn't go to one person usually. And the second half of my talk was written by Andrea. Unfortunately, she's not here, so I'm going to give this talk. Um, and that was for another type of laser physics. High intensity beams for extreme light matter interaction. Ultra short. Um, okay, so the next half of the uh, laser physics prize, which is going to be the shorter half of the talk, was given to Gerard Moreau, which I can't pronounce in a proper fresh, uh, French accent, and Donna Strickland. And this was important to, uh, to Andrea because she worked with ultra short pulses. Uh, but it was important to me also for two reasons. Um, and here's a little bit about these people. And so Andrea actually knew somebody who knew them. So she got some of the inside information from Professor, Professor Judith Dawes at Macquarie University. How did she describe him? So we have the supervisor and the PhD student. He was extremely enthusiastic, he's a good supervisor, highly competitive, typically French. What does that mean? She was very practical. I did not set out to save the world. I think you should do what you're good at. That's enough. That's some good, good advice, very practical. She was proud to be an engineer. There's some competition between scientists and engineers. It's good to be proud of what you're good at. She loved Christmas lights. So you see a lot of green and red on these slides. Apparently she went into this laser lab and was like, green and red lights everywhere, Christmas lights. I like this science. Uh, what's coming up next? Okay, so two things that were important about this to me. First, we won Nobel Prize in Physics in 55 years, only the third ever. Too long, but a nice step. And this was really meaningful to me. The first paper that they were awarded this prize for, she was only 26 when she did that work. 
When you're 26, you're not thinking that you're doing something that important. Nobody is. You might hope it might be one day, but that was really incredible for me. Both those facts, to me, are equally incredible because there's a lot of uh, difficulty as a young scientist in establishing you, um, establishing yourself. So they want it for chirped pulse amplification. What does this mean? Well, firstly, it was really cool because this is the kind of uh, sort of laser pulses, how things were going. They had lasers, they had Q switching, different laser technologies were coming along. And then there was this kind of flat regime. And what they wanted was more powerful lasers because we all want more power because it's good. But I'll tell you why it's good later. Um, and then chirped pulse amplification came along at the end of this kind of flat period and things took off again. So it was a really big breakthrough in terms of laser powers that were achievable. Um, so this is not a linear scale. So an optical pulse. So there's going to be a pretty quick journey through this. If you think of this is a continuous wave and this is an optical pulse. So its intensity varies with time. So this is electric field strength and this is time. So it's a burst of light. And there are some things about optical pulses. So they have an energy, they have a, a time, and they have a peak power. And so having a high peak power is a way to get high intensity from putting in, if you put in a continuous wave, turn it into a pulse, you can get high power. And high power lets you do cool things. Um, and so people wanted higher power pulses. And you can put a laser through a gain medium. So this is some kind of fundamental laser uh, science where you have an atom in the excited state. Um, so it's uh, elevated from the ground level to the excited state. It's sitting in the excited state. You can simulate it with an incident photon and it will fall down. And then you get coherent light coming out, same frequency in phase. That's the kind of concept of a laser. And the gain medium is where this process happens. But when you get high P powers, not very good for the gain medium. These are some actual pictures of gain medium that got fried. Often they're made of very expensive materials. A same concept as Bart Simpson here melting his toy soldier. So people wanted high pulp, uh, piece pulp power. <laughs> I'm getting confused there. We want high peak power of our pulse. And they don't want to destroy their gain media. So what do you do? This is an idea behind taking the Fourier transform of the, the system. So you can go from time. We're going to go from the time representation to the frequency representation. So a continuous wave, uh, wave is just one frequency. And in the frequency spectrum, it just looks like, like one peak there. But if we take the optical pulse in time, if we take the Fourier transform, it's a broad, made up of a broad range of frequencies. And oh, what does this animation do? The solution was found in the spectrum. So we have a spectrum of frequencies and we put them into a material that different frequencies of light travel at different velocities. We can change the shape of that spectrum and optical fibers do exactly that. So in optical fibers, you get dispersion, which is different wavelengths, different frequencies travel at different velocities. So we put a waveform into a long optical fiber, it goes round and round. These are great animations. Um, it spreads out. So the blue wavelength, so in this case, the red wavelengths are going faster than the blue wavelengths. So that peak spreads out and the peak power goes down. So the optical fiber gives us ways to take our peak and spread it out. So suddenly maybe this peak power is not so destructive of our gain media. And so this is the concept. You put in your short laser pulse, you stretch it out, you, um, run it through an amplifier. You don't destroy the amplifier because you stretched out the peak and lowered the peak height. And then you put it back through dispersion in the other direction to compress it back again. And so you've got now your very high peak power without blowing anything up. It's always good not to blow things up in the lab. What can you do then with a high peak power? So there's different, and so you know, you can think of the peak as being very high we can think of it as also being very short, and they're both useful properties. So you think something that this is used for is laser eye surgery. So these are femtosecond pulses, hundreds of kilowatts, very high energy. 
And there's a difference between the heating that you get with a nanosecond laser, where you get shockwave damage, <clears throat> and the very precise damage you can get with a femtosecond laser that makes these kind of things possible. Also, ablation of things like blockages in coronary arteries and very precise data storage. And you can also use these lasers, these pulsing lasers, as strobe lights. So the same way you might use a strobe light if you're moving around in a strobe light, it looks like you're getting freeze frame of somebody dancing badly. Um, in this case, you can get strobe effects with molecular systems. So the faster your strobe pulses, the better you can quantify fast movement. If you can get down to attosecond laser pulses, you can see electrons moving. You're going fast enough, your frame rate is fast enough that you can detect very fine molecular behavior. So that's pretty amazing that you can see these extremely fast molecular processes happen. So it's a great tool to make, you know, basically here they describe it as the world's fastest camera. Where is this going? So when, when we put laser power up, interesting things happen. Different science happens. Relativistic optics, nonlinear uh, QED optics. And these are the types of things that people can now start to explore with this type of tool, putting extreme amounts of light into materials and seeing what happens. And of course, this is why Andrea is excited about it is that this is the kind of science that she did here at the University of Sydney and other people here still do it. Things like making an optical memory, like you have a magnetic memory, can you have an optical information storage? Can you look at entangled photons, looking at quantum effects between photons and looking to make optical circuitry? So could you have an, electronic, uh, an optical circuit that's like an electronic circuit, but everything's moving at the speed of light? So that's the kind of thing you can start to do with these femtosecond pulses. Was that short enough? Yeah, beautiful. Ultra short. <laughs>